savings. Now, this is our fifth lesson that we have looked at on uh, our Christian Finances series. And Proverbs 6 is where we want to turn. Lord willing, we'll have one more, not obviously next week, next week's Resurrection Sunday, but two weeks from tonight will be the final one, I believe, on uh, giving. And um, the original plan was just to have five, but uh, I think the Lord would have us give one more. And uh, so Proverbs chapter number six, tonight we want to talk about savings. We've looked at several things, the the foundation of Christian finances and and having a a right relationship with finances is understanding that we are stewards. We talked about that quite a bit. We talked about being frugal with our money and not just wasting it. Uh, We have talked about the need to set up a budget, uh, the need to have a plan for uh, what we're going to do with our money. If we do not plan, then things will happen to us rather than us happening to them, okay? And we don't want things to just happen to our money. We want to plan because, again, we are stewards. And so God expects us to have things planned out. And we may not be able to know everything that's going to happen, but usually the trouble we have is not because it was some surprise. Like Christmas comes every year, right? So we shouldn't be surprised when it's time to buy the kids gifts. It's every year at the same time, right? Usually it's our lack of planning that causes us to have financial difficulties. We talked last week about debt and the need to be very careful with debt and to use it, again, as a steward would use it very carefully. Proverbs chapter 6 tonight, we're going to talk about savings. Proverbs 6 verse 1, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now notice verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. There in Proverbs 6, God gave us an example of the ant. The ant, as it says in another place in God's word, is a very small creature and yet very wise. That ant, as it says here in Proverbs 6, has no guide, overseer, or ruler. There's nobody cracking the whip on this ant, telling the ant to get ready for winter that's coming. But the ant, because of the wisdom given by God during the summertime, during the harvest time, when the, when the uh, grass seeds and other kinds of food for that ant are available, that ant and those ants are busy working, and they're working together. And what are they doing? They're not just going out and gathering food and eating it all right away. They're gathering, yes, enough to eat, but they're preparing for the winter. They're storing that. They're using the time of harvest to prepare prepare for the time of lean times. That's a great lesson for you and me. We should go to the ant and learn. On the front page of your notes there, you'll see the statement I put at the bottom there where it says, a buffer of savings can make the difference between staying afloat or financially sinking. You realize that you can have things in order and do things decently in an order and even be somewhat frugal and and be careful with debt and all of that, but if you're always running on the red line and you don't have a buffer, it only takes a small problem to arise, and that can toss you over into financial ruin. And by the way, that happens to a lot of people. We as Americans are very wealthy. We as Americans are extremely wealthy. When you look at the American lifestyle and culture, and uh, you know all that we have, it is just amazing what we have compared to the rest of the world. And yet, do you realize that today, the average American cannot handle any kind of a financial setback of more than a hundred or two dollars? The average American, if their furnace went out on their house, they'd be in trouble because they're running paycheck to paycheck. 
And a lot of Americans today have their credit cards, several of them, maxed out. And if a financial setback comes to them, they're off into a real destructive place financially. And I want to encourage you and me that, again, in this whole idea of Christian finances, if we're going to be balanced Christians and bring honor and glory to God with our lives, we need to have this area run decently and in order. We need to have this area okay. You and I may not be wealthy, but we can run our finances decently and in order so that we are balanced Christians that bring honor and glory to the Lord. And part of that is having some savings. And I want to encourage you with that to have some savings. All right, we'll pray, and then we'll get into the lesson here tonight. Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word to your people, and I do thank you for the illustration that you gave us in your word of the ant. And I thank you, Lord, that not only in your word, you gave it to even the lost person in nature. And a lost person who will pay attention can learn a lesson that you gave through nature. And I pray, dear Lord, that we as Christians, with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, with your word in our hands, in our language, that we would learn from the ant, that you would teach us to be savers, that, Lord, you'd help us with that. I pray for myself and my family, and I pray for all of us here, that we would begin to be wise, not only in this area of savings, but in every area of our financial life, that we would be wise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you would look with me in your notes there. What I did for this lesson is I gave you five questions, all right? Five questions. The first one on the first page is, why should I save? Let me give you some reasons why you should save. Number one, because in the sin-cursed world, evil days are sure to come, all right? We put under there the, the statement there that some would call it Murphy's Law. Does anybody use that term anymore? Or is that just an old person term? All right, there are a few, all right. Yeah, but some of you who raised your hands, you don't exactly, you're not exactly millennials, all right? But uh, anyway, I digress, all right? Uh, years ago, it was always referred to as, well, that's Murphy's Law, right? The furnace went out, or the car's, car broke down, that's Murphy's Law. If it's gonna, uh, if something bad could happen, it will happen, that's the idea of Murphy's Law. But the, friend, the, the thing is, my friends, that's not Murphy's Law, that's natural law. We live in a sin-cursed world. Everything is in a state of decay. It's not getting better, it is getting worse. And you and I need to understand that, that we live in a sin-cursed world, and there's all kinds of things going on behind the scenes, even in the spiritual realm, that we don't see, and we are in a sin-cursed world, and evil days are sure to come. And by evil, I don't mean wicked, I just mean negative problems. And God has allowed that in this world, yes, even for the Christian, those things would come. I hope it didn't take you long as a Christian to figure out that when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, life did not get necessarily easier. In fact, if anything, the heat got turned up a little bit. Thankfully, we have the Lord. Praise God that we have his wisdom to know how to prepare for those evil days. But evil days are going to come. Job 5, 7 in your notes Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Every time the sparks fly upward, it is part of natural law. Heat rises. Well, part of natural law is man is born unto trouble. There is going to be trouble in life. You and I need to be prepared. We should also save, letter B, because if you have a surplus now, there is a reason. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Why does the ant... Save during summer, because that's when the surplus is. And if you and I are in a situation where there is a surplus, and by a surplus I mean that we have money that is, uh, well, I'm, I'm missing the term here, but it, 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 we have discretionary spending. That's what I'm trying to think of. If we have money that is discretionary, that's surplus. What I mean by that is this. If, if you and I have enough money to have a subscription to any kind of entertainment form, then we have surplus. If we have money to you know, have the latest cell phone or within a couple of years, then we have surplus. If we have money to, you know, we could list on and on, if we have any discretionary money at all where we are not down to the absolute bare bones, then we have a surplus. 
And a lot of Americans, a lot of times, we don't think that way. We think to ourselves, well, I, I don't have anything extra. But again, when we go to the store, uh, we put in the cart a 12-pack of Coke or Diet Coke or some other kind of ungodly uh, liquid that we're going to put in our bodies later. And by the way, I love Coke, all right? I don't drink it that often, but there's not much better than Coca-Cola. Amen and amen. That's my time in Mexico, Brother Esteban. Those Mexicans had a bad influence on me. We love our Coca-Cola, all right? My dad was the same way, though, too. Whenever we'd have a Pepsi, he'd say, no, thank you, that's a WW drink. You remember that, Donna? For women and wimps. <laughs> he said, I would take a Coke, thank you very much, all right? But listen, I was at Quick Trip the other day, gassing up and using the restroom, and as I came out of the restroom, they had a stand there for Coca-Cola. Now, this is Quick Trip, not Woodman's or someplace like that, but nonetheless... I believe that 12-pack, I believe the price on it was $11 or $12. Number one, that's ludicrous. <laughs> but number two, anybody who spends $11 or $12 on a 12-pack of Coke has a surplus. Because we don't need that. You know water still works? To hydrate, in fact, you'll be a lot better off, amen? <laughs> if we get it, stay away from the soda and juice and, and the rest of the things and we just drink water. But, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have those things. I'm just saying let's change our perspective a little bit and recognize that sometimes we think, oh, I don't have any surplus. But we do. We're just spending the surplus we have on things that we want, not necessarily what we should spend it on, okay? So because if I have a surplus now, there's a reason why I have a surplus. God is giving me that surplus for a reason. If I can afford to go, and I can right now, to Woodman's and buy a 12-pack of Coke or to Culver's tonight after the service and get some custard or, you know, we've talked about these things. If I have that money, well, God gave it to me and for a reason. And some of that might be to enjoy life a little bit. And again, not wrong to go to Culver's and Arnold and Jan met somebody who was in church, to a couple that were in church this morning, that they met at Culver's, and they wanted me to tell you, Arnold said, that is a good place to go soul winning. <laughs> right, Brother Arnold? Now, they were already saved, so that doesn't count. But anyway, they, but they were in church, right? So it's not wrong to do that. But at the same time, God may be giving us that surplus because later on there's going to be a dearth. And we as Americans are looking at what could be a dearth at any time. A dearth like we've never seen before. A dearth that could even blow away what our great-grandparents, or in my case, my grandparents, saw. And so God may be giving us a surplus now, not so that we can live life high on the hog, so to speak, so that we could be prepared for evil days. Turn with me quickly. We don't have time to look at all of it, but Genesis 41. You'll recognize this passage of Scripture. I'm sure you could probably guess I was going to go here. Genesis 41, verse 25. Here is such a great Bible illustration of God giving a surplus because a, a, a dearth was in the future. Genesis 41, verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. And I love this phrase. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Isn't God a good God? Pharaoh didn't love God. Pharaoh could care less about God. He was worshiping other gods. But the God of heaven showed Pharaoh what he was about to do. We serve a great God. Verse 26, the seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous." And for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. You see, God was showing Pharaoh, I'm going to give you seven years of blessing in preparation for the seven years of famine. Would to God that we as his people would have the same wisdom that Pharaoh had. To recognize that maybe this time of plenty 
is God preparing me for a time of famine to come? I should be a saver. You should be a saver because if we have a surplus now, there is a reason. Let's go back to our notes. Letter C, here's another reason. Because without a plan for saving, you are likely to foolishly spend all that comes into your possession. I'm going to say that again. Without a plan for saving, you are likely to foolishly spend all that comes into your possession. I want you to think tonight of your finances like a river. Think of it as a river. Can you picture a river in your mind? Your income could be a very large river, as I put in your notes, like the mighty Mississippi. A big river that's flowing fast and is very wide. That could be your finances. If so, I want to be your friend. Or your financial river could be like a very small river that I know of in southern Sonora in Mexico where my wife and I and our children were missionaries. And Daniel and I used to walk across a bridge, very dangerous bridge. I was not a very good father. That was a dangerous bridge, but we had fun. Walk across that bridge, across that little river, the Rio Mayo. It's a small little river in southern Sonora. Now, Sonora in Mexico is right below Arizona and is very arid. It's right next to the uh, Bay of California, so there's water right nearby, but you'd never know it. It is very barren. There's nothing there. It's ugly as all get out and hot, very hot and humid. But it's still barren. Your uh, finances might be like that little river. I used to laugh when I would go down there because, and it's the same way in Texas, by the way, Riley. Sorry, Texas does not have good rivers. I apologize. But when I lived in Oklahoma and I drove down to Texas to see some of my friends and I crossed the mighty Red River that divides Texas from Oklahoma. I thought, wow, I've watched John Wayne movies about the Red River. This has got to be a big river. And you realize, no, that's a puddle. <laughs> and you know what? In Mexico, it's the same. That Rio Mayo is a little river. Very little water that goes through it. You can walk across most areas of the Rio Mayo. But here's the thing. Here's what I want you to think about. A savings plan, Roman numeral two in your notes under letter C, a savings plan is like putting a dam on that river. You know that, I don't know what year, but many years ago, they put a dam on the Mayo River. And you know that today, a great portion of the fruit and vegetables that you get here in the United States in the winter comes from not just Sonora, Mexico, also Sinaloa and other places like it. But you know why you get your vegetables and fruit from there? Because they dammed up the river years ago. And behind that dam, what happened? That water began to just pile up and pile up and pile up and pile up. And today, they have come up with a just unbelievably great way to irrigate that land. And that little bit of water that comes through there, it's not much. Because it has been dammed up and there is a reservoir, they can apply it here and apply it there. And amazing fruits and vegetables are grown in that area that is very barren, all because someone was smart enough to say, we should save some of this water. Because without it, it's just traveling by. There it goes, and here comes some more, and there it goes, and here comes some more, and there it goes. And many of us, our finances are like that. Here comes some more, and there it goes. Here comes some more, and there it goes. And we wonder why when we have a need, there's nothing here. I make all this money. What happens to my money? It's because you've never put a dam on the river. You need to learn to put a dam on the river and save a great amount of that so that there, when there comes a time that you have a need, you can thoughtfully and carefully apply that money so that it can do a great amount of good. Look at your notes there. Without a dam on the river, the large amount of water in the river is just passing through quickly and can do little good. It does some, but little. But with that dam, the water can be thoughtfully applied and even a small river can have a great impact. And again, it's amazing what it has done to the landscape and the economy of Sonora, Mexico. All because they thoughtfully applied a dam to a little river. Letter D, another reason why you and I should be savers is because God wants to use us to be a blessing to others. 
And do you realize that you can't give what you don't have? A lot of times, there are opportunities that we have to be a blessing to somebody. But we have nothing. And it's not because money wasn't coming into our account, but it's because we never saved it. It came and it went. And the next check came and it went. And the next check came and it went. And then there's a need. There was a couple in our service this morning that Brother Arnold and Miss Jan met, I uh, mentioned to you, at Culver's. And they were here this morning. Hopefully we'll see more of them. But their little one is in the children's hospital downtown. Was born four weeks ago. I think it was four, five weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, uh, with half a heart. And is struggling. Has to have several surgeries. They had to amputate the little one's, the boy. His name is Ezra. Ezra James. Had to amputate his foot just this last week. Listen, I don't know what needs they will have. But I have a sense that they have some needs. You know, if you and I are just letting our money just go through and somebody like that comes and our heart goes out to them, but we have nothing to give. There's nothing there. I can't give what I don't have. See, God wants, if I have surplus, it may not just be that God wants me to dam up the river, so to speak, so that I'll have more. It may be that God wants me to dam up the river so that someday somebody else can come along and I can say, here, here's some water that God led me to save for you. And boy, I tell you what, you want to talk about joy and happiness in your heart? I don't know of a better way to have joy in your heart than to be able to have some money that you can actually afford to give to somebody because you've saved it. And you can say, here, let me be a blessing to you. Well, you want to talk about putting a smile on your face, that will do it. So God wants us to be a saver because of that. Let's look at number two. Next question, when should I save? Well, first of all, letter A, after God. Not after God saves, all right? But after you give God the tithe. Let me encourage you with that. After you give God tithe, Genesis 14, 20. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. That was Abram, right? God was... Uh, uh, met Abraham in the uh, form of Melchizedek, and uh, Abraham gave him tithes of all. Why is tithing first important? We're going to see this a little bit later on in our notes. But the temptation when you do get some savings, the temptation is to trust in the savings. And we're going to see that later on, and I'm going to warn you against that. Well, one of the ways to help avoid trusting in your savings is to tithe. Because you're reminding yourself every week or every two weeks or every month or however often you get paid, you're reminding yourself, I'm trusting in God. Here, God, you are my God. Here, God, you are my God. God, I'm trusting in you, not my savings. God, you are my God. That's what tithe is all about. And so I would encourage you, when should you uh, save? After you tithe. And then not only that, Roman numeral two, the next page of your notes, after I give to God's work. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. Let me encourage you to give to the Lord's work. Tithe, yes. But above and beyond that, give. I would never ask you to give what you do not have. But I will ask you to give sacrificially out of what you do have. And by God's grace, I'll do the same. And God will bless us, and God will use us. Let me encourage you, after you give to God's work, and then uh, letter B, this is after God now, and then letter B, after I get my finances in order. We won't look up 1 Corinthians 14, 40, but you know it. Let all things be done decently and in order. So I should save after I get my finances in order. In other words, reminding you, get a functioning budget set up. Get that set up, do that. You don't, you're not able to save if you don't have a plan for your money. Not only that, get a plan to get out of debt. You're, you're handicapped in your ability to save much if you're paying interest to a bank. Okay? Now, um, if we were to go, let's just say, to Chicago, all right? If we were to go to Chicago. 
the largest buildings in Chicago. I don't know exactly. I'm assuming the Will is it called the Willis Tower now? I'm assuming that's the largest. I don't know who owns that anymore. But uh, I, I would encourage you that most of the large buildings in Chicago are owned by banks. Why is that? Where do banks get their money? From little people like you and me. Now, do they come to you and me with a gun to our head and say, give me all of your money? No. They come to us in the form of advertisements for credit. And in that advertisement for credit, you open it up and it says, look, you can have this credit card and buy whatever you want and pay some other time. And in the meantime, we're going to charge you a percentage and you and I gladly do it and that percentage goes to them and their house is bigger than your house. Okay? And by the way, we do the same thing like we talked about last week with a mortgage. We do the same thing with car loans. I heard a statistic yesterday. Caleb and I were watching a car show where they were reviewing some new car. By the way, it was a beautiful Audi, and I want it. But I found out it's 129000 and I said, never mind. But they said the average car payment, now not for an Audi that's 129000 but the average car payment in America today is over $700 a month. <laughs> Wow, that's not much less than my mortgage. Listen, that's a lot of money. And when you first take out that car loan, how much of that is going towards the principal being taken down? If you understand debt at all, you understand in the beginning stages, basically none. You're just giving that to the bank. Here you go, Citibank. Here you go, go build your buildings in Chicago, right? So it would be wise for you and me to recognize before I can be saving really well, I should probably stop giving my money to Chase or Discover or, you know, whatever, right? I need to get my financial house in order. Roman numeral three under letter B, begin to save some now for a rainy day. Even if you are not out of debt, begin to save some now for a rainy day. Then the amount would differ for each person. In other words, even before you would really work hard at getting out of debt, I would encourage you, have something set aside for a rainy day because the furnace is going to break, okay? The car is going to need brakes. <laughs> the, the car is going to need tires, right? A child is going to get sick, whatever. Those things happen. So save some for a rainy day even before you work to get out of debt, and that amount will differ for each person. I put in there some scenarios. Homeowners will need more in savings than renters. That makes sense, right? Because guess what? You don't get to call the landlord. That's what I hate about home ownership. All right, I keep trying to call the landlord, but he never picks up. All right, married adults will need more than singles. Those with children, you'll never have enough money. Right? You need more as well than somebody who doesn't have children. Those with two cars will need more than those with just one car. You get the idea, right? Look at your lifestyle. Look at what you have. Look at what, what is going to require payments, and it, some of it depends on what kind of a deductible do you have on your health insurance and things like that. Think ahead of those things and set some money aside for an emergency fund or for a rainy day. And then once out of debt, you can begin to save at a higher rate. Once you get out of debt, boy, you can, you can really apply some saving at that point. Number three, how much should I save? Well, letter A, as with everything, save in light of stewardship. Keep in mind you are a steward. That money that is coming into your account is not yours, it's God's. So save with that in mind. Would God want you to save? I believe he would. I believe he would want you to have some money set aside for a rainy day. Again, if you're dealing with surplus, I believe he would want that. But save in light of stewardship. You can go too far. You could save so much money that you begin to hoard money. Now, truth of the matter is, I don't know of very many Americans who are hoarding money. It's just not our culture. So I don't think it's a big danger, but we do want to watch out for that. Letter B, save as much as you can. I reminded you in, in Roman numeral 1 and 2, remember to be frugal. You can save a lot of money when you're frugal, when you don't waste money on things that are unnecessary. And again, I don't, I don't want to give you the idea that you can never have fun, that you should, if you're a good Christian with money, that you never spend anything on anything 
quote unquote foolish. I don't believe that's right either. You can go in the ditch on either side of the road. But remember to be frugal, be careful with money. Don't just throw it around as if it didn't have any real serious nature to it. Roman number two, use your money for experiences over things. Use it for experiences over things. Now, my family and I are not great examples in, in everything in the area of finances, I promise you that. But one of the areas, and I think it's just because of my wife and who she is and her personality and, and then mine as well, is we have learned, especially more and more as we uh, get older, uh, that we're less inclined to want to spend money out going somewhere and buying something than we are. We just want to be together. And uh, we had a, a couple of days of vacation this last week, and well, one of the things she asked me if we could do, she said, could we just go for a drive? And we did. We took on Tuesday, we took some time, and we went uh, east of here on the Kettle Moraine Scenic Drive. Not all of it, but part of it, which runs on some county roads through the Kettle Moraine uh, State Forest and different areas like that. And boy, we just had a great time. It was an experience rather than things. And it costs some money. Gas is expensive, <laughs> if you haven't figured that out yet, right? So it cost us some money as far as gas. And uh, we stopped at a quick trip again and uh, got the kids some sodas or something like that just for fun and had a good time. But those are the things now that we've learned. You know what? We enjoy that a lot more than if we went shopping to the outlets and bought a bunch of things we didn't need. And I would encourage you to begin to think that way. Buy experiences and not things. And you'll find that you can save some money that way. Letter C, under how much should I save? Have as a goal to someday be able to save like Joseph. Okay? And I want to encourage you, this is not a rule. Does everybody understand that? This is not a rule. But I would encourage you, have as a goal that someday you could be like Joseph. Well, how did Joseph save? If you remember the story, it's in Genesis 41, 34. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. The fifth part, how, what percentage is that? That's 20%, isn't it? The fifth part. Now, I think God put that in there for a reason. I don't think it's a rule. But I think God wants us to be wise and recognize, you know what, if I could get to that point where I could cut my expenses enough to where 20% of my income I could save, that might be a wise thing to do. And I would encourage you, have that as a goal. That'll take some work for most people. That mean you'd have to work hard at getting your mortgage paid down. But think about it, if you didn't have a mortgage, if you could pay your mortgage down and get it to zero, imagine how much money you'd have coming in every month that is discretionary. That's a lot. And one of the things that I want to encourage you with is uh, one of our family members works at a bank. And this family member was telling me about the fact that, you know, most people nowadays have not one mortgage, they have two mortgages. This individual was telling me, that's normal now. That you have the primary mortgage and then you have a secondary one that you're just borrowing on the equity of your home, which means forever you're upside down on that house. Or forever you're in debt to the bank. And again, the bank is building their buildings and let me encourage you to think the opposite. I wanna have zero mortgage, that's my goal. And when I have zero mortgage, which by the way is very doable, I would encourage you to Google a uh, mortgage calculator. There are a bunch of them on the internet, and you can plug in the numbers. If I begin to pay this much extra on my mortgage, how quickly could I pay that mortgage off? And begin to attack it. Imagine what you could do if you had no credit card debt, no vehicle debt, and your mortgage was paid off. I bet you could easily save 20% and be like Joseph. And I think God would... Be pleased if we would do that. Let's go to the last page here. We need to be quick with this. Number four, where should I save? And I want to say as I go through number four, I am not an all-knowing financial guru. I think all of you know that here, okay? But let me just encourage you in two ways. Letter A, have an emergency fund that's easy to access. Remember we talked about that rainy day. Have some money set aside in a form that's easy to access. Don't put it in a CD 
that you know, won't mature for six months or whatever. Have it easy to access. Just a savings account would be good. And you might say, well, Pastor, but it's not earning you know, any interest whatsoever. Hey, it, it's, it's not about putting it away to earn interest. It's about having some money for when the furnace goes down. It's about having some money set aside for when the car breaks down, okay? Have that money easy to access. Put it in a, listen, put it in a specific savings account. Don't have it in your checking account. Are you hearing me on this? Don't put it in your checking account. Say, why, Pastor? Why, you're so mean. Yeah, because you know what you'll do with it. You're like me. If it's there, it's burning a hole in your pocket. Oh, man, it's there. And there's those, that pair of shoes I've always wanted. Or that thing I've always wanted, right? And it, it, put it in a separate account. And I would encourage you, maybe even a different bank than your primary bank. But whatever, put it so it's easily accessible, but not so easily accessible that you're tempted to spend it. And then letter B, have some type of retirement account. Begin to save while you are young, if it's possible, all right? Those of you who are young, I'll leave it up to you to decide that. Let me encourage you, don't wait until you are in your 40s to save. I did just some, some math real quick. Let's say that you graduate from college or whatever, you finish whatever training you're going to do at 22 years old, and you want to begin to save. And so you have, until 65, you have 43 years. Is my math right on that? You're 22 plus 43 is 65. So 43 years. You realize that if you just put $250 a month in some type of a retirement account, $250 a month, which, by the way, is not much at all. It may seem like a lot, but once you start realizing how much money you're going to be spending on everything else, that's not that much. Listen, my, my electric and gas bill together during the winter isn't too far from that. And probably some of you are like me with that. Okay, So $250 a month isn't that much, but if you'll do that, if you only get an 8% return, which is actually somewhat low, you can get higher than that if you, if you do it right. But with only 8% return, do you realize that when you retire at 65, you could have, and you would have, $1.03 million? Think about that. $250 a month, that's not much. That's, not, that's something that the average American easily can do. But young people, let me encourage you with this. Here's what most young people who are 22 years old do. Instead of beginning to save in some type of a retirement account, they instead go down to the car lot and they say, ooh, that one's pretty, right? Or they spend that same $250 a month on, you know, whatever, on shoes and clothes or going out with friends or whatever. And boy, start now when you are young. Some kind of a retirement account. Why? Because Social Security probably won't be there for you. And you want to be able to not be so wealthy that you can you know, flaunt your wealth. I, I hope nobody here would have that mentality. But you want to be able to, when you are at retirement age, you want to be able to live. You want to be able to be a blessing. And as I've talked to you about before, there are people that I know of today that are in their retirement years who are missionaries. And when they were in their working years, the one guy I'm thinking of specifically, Brother, uh, Brother Scott is his name. His last name is Scott. Uh, he, uh, he and his wife, or I'm sorry, he worked uh, on the, um, uh, with a power company in Wyoming. And when he got to his retirement years, he said, oh, I'm getting my pension now. I'm going to be a missionary in Mexico. And he has an orphanage today. He started a couple different churches. His Spanish is horrible. But he's using his retirement years to serve the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. You could do that same thing. Imagine what a blessing. And you may not be the missionary, but you know what? You could go to a place like Bulgaria and just be there with a missionary like Jeff and Grace Shergalis and just help them. Hey, I'm here. Don't need any finances. I can rent an apartment and I can live here because I have a retirement account and I just want to help you. Or whatever. There's so many things you could do. And God wants to use your life. But you have to be wise. You have to begin to think about those things now. Avoid get-rich-quick thinking. 
and instead think long term, okay? Avoid get-rich-quick thinking. Leave the stuff alone that's, well, oh, man, I heard that somebody bought such and such and then they sold it a month later and they you know, gained however many percent on it. That works every once in a while, but most of the time people lose on it. Begin to think long term, okay? Be wise. Remember, you are a steward of that money. And then I would encourage you with this, get an advisor with your finances. Get an advisor. And what I mean by that is not pastor. Get a financial advisor. They will help you. And I can refer you to the, the guy who helps me. It's a blessing. Listen, he's a blessing. Uh, he's, a, he's a Christian. I believe he's born again. And uh, he understands my thinking when I tell him, I don't want to be rich. No, if God makes me rich, I'm not going to complain. But that's not what I'm after. I just want to be able to save enough to where when I'm so old that I can't preach and be a blessing to the church anymore, the church doesn't have to continue to pay me a salary because they feel bad for their pastor. I want to be able to ride off into the sunset, so to speak, and say, I serve God with my, you know, with my greatest years, and now church, here's another younger pastor, there you go, and I'm going to go and serve God in another way. I want to be able to do that. And so he understands that, and I can help you to find somebody who understands what it means to be a Christian, all right? Number five, what if? That's the last question. What if? Letter A, what if I have no savings? Well, you can already guess what I'm going to say. Get busy saving right away. Number two, reduce expenses to the bare minimum. Number three, start saving what you can, even if it's small. You might say, but I only have $25 a month. Good, save that. Save it, save it, save it, save it, save it. Don't waste it. Start saving now. God will bless you and it will grow. Letter B, what if I barely make enough to scrape by? Save what little you can and trust God to enlarge it. I believe that if you are faithful in the little things, God will give you greater things. So if you only make enough to barely scrape by and you say, well, I only have, again, $25 a month extra or $5 a month extra, maybe you should save that. And maybe God would say, there's somebody I can entrust with more because they're wise. And I believe God will. Let her see. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, let her see. What if I have been saving already? Well, fulfill the charge given in 1 Timothy 6. I wish we had time to look at it. We just don't. But I would encourage you to look at 1 Timothy 6. And here's what it says. Don't be high-minded. All right, if you've been saving and you have some money set aside, you've dammed up the river a long time ago and now the reservoir is getting full, hey, that's a blessing. Don't let it go to your head. Because I guarantee you, you haven't saved enough. And what I mean by that is, if the economy crashes, I don't know that anyone saved enough. I think we ought to be wise and try to do what we can. But don't get high-minded. Don't think, oh boy, I did it right, and those other people, they aren't as smart as me. Be careful, all right? Also, don't trust those riches, but rather trust in God. Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Matthew 6, 26, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are he not much better than they? Do you see what God has done in his word? On one hand, he's given us the ant as an example. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. She saves is basically what he's saying. In another passage of Scripture, he says, look at the birds. They don't save, and God takes care of them. Do you realize that God wants us to take both of those? They're both true. God gave us two illustrations of seemingly contradictory things, but they're not. They're a balance. That you and I ought to do what we can to save and consider the ways of the ant and be wise. But in the end of it all, Lord, I'm not trusting in that savings because you take care of even the birds and God, you're going to take care of me. And the truth of the matter is, if the economy crashes tomorrow, and it might, I did what I could. I saved what I could. I was pretty foolish with a lot of things in my finances. But I did save some, and I'm just trusting in the mercy and grace of God to keep me. That's what we need to do. And then be generous and lay up treasures in heaven. If you have saved, be generous. 
Matthew 6, 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Remember, God gave you that savings for a reason. Be generous with it. Lay up treasure in heaven. That treasure in heaven is what you really want. I love, and I, I, I hope I'm not too carnal in this, but I love the um, Charles Dickens story, A Christmas Carol. And, and I love the ending of it. Because, and again, I realize it's a lost situation. It's not from the Bible. But there's some biblical truth there. Here's a guy who's stingy and holds on to it all. And he's miserable and has no friends and all of that. And when he's confronted by the reality that, I love what his friend Jacob Marley says in that situation when he meets him. He says, listen, mankind was my business. I was good in business, but I didn't realize mankind was my business. You know, sometimes as Christians, we need to remember that as well. Why does God have us here? Mankind is our business. To be a blessing to others, to shine the light of the gospel in, in, in people's hearts and lives and to use our resources to be a blessing. And sometimes that means even just financially, just to be generous and give. And sometimes we can overthink things and, well, I, you know, I'll give to missions, but I'm not going to give to somebody who has a need over here and Listen, don't overthink it. Just be generous. God blesses a cheerful giver, and I want to encourage you to do that. But in order to have our financial house in order, savings is a wise and important part of that. Let's pray, and I'll let you go. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we've had to look at the area of finances and savings. Lord, thank you for the things that we've learned. Help us to be faithful, to use your money that you put into our hands wisely, and to not just Spend all of it quickly as it comes through our hands, but to save some of it, that it can be applied wisely and thoughtfully. Lord, would you bless? Would you help me in that? Lord, forgive me for so much foolishness in my life regarding finances. Help me to be wise. And I pray for each and every one here the same, and especially those who are young. Lord, give them a wisdom that is beyond their years, that is biblical that comes from your spirit, that they would grow to be uh, people of God that can use the blessings that you've given to be a blessing to others and bring glory and honor to your name. Now, Lord, would you please dismiss us with your blessing. Uh, Keep us safe this week. Help us to love one another in Jesus' name. Amen.